It says the word of God. <clears throat> well, dear congregation, our sermon text today, 2 Samuel 12 proclaims to us the triumph of the mercy and grace of God. And I want you to see this. I want you to rejoice in the victory of God's mercy upon our rebellion and upon our sins. Those whom God has accepted in the beloved, he will never forsake. Isn't that good news? He will never leave nor forsake his people. And even our sins cannot separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The Lord is at work in the lives of his people. And he graciously sanctifies us through his word so that we die more and more to sin. And we live more and more unto righteousness. And when we sin as a loving father, he disciplines us, right? But he will never reject us. He will never leave us. Children, do you remember what the Lord said to Peter at the Last Supper? Right before he was going to sin grievously. Peter, the apostle, was going to stand before people in public and deny the Lord Jesus three times. And yet listen to what Jesus said to Peter. In Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Listen, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Jesus doesn't say, and if you come back, strengthen your brothers. When you come back, Peter, you will come back. You will backslide temporarily, but I will not let you go. Satan desired to have Peter. Could Satan have him? Not a chance. You know why? Because Jesus prays for us. He ever liveth to make intercession for his people. As he prayed for Peter, he prays for you Christians that your faith fail not. Jesus says that he's the good shepherd and his sheep are in his hand. No one can snatch us out of his hand. The only way for the devil to get to us is to break the arm of Jesus and snatch it out, out of his hand. That will never happen. Peter sinned grievously, but the Lord did not give up on Peter. But the Lord brought him back with repentance so that Peter repented. He wept bitterly over the sin of denying his master. This is God's work of grace in the lives of his people. 1 Peter 1 verse 5 says, and Peter knew that, that true Christians are kept by the power of God. We are kept by the power of God. And therefore, Philippians, Philippians 1 verse 6, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So true believers may fall into grievous sins and for a time continue therein. But they can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally secure, eternally saved. See, the Holy Spirit, when we sin, and I hope you know that, because if you know, have no conviction of sin, you need to examine yourselves. But as Christians, you know, when you sin, the Spirit does not leave you, but convicts you, doesn't he? He convicts you until you come to a point of repentance. He doesn't leave you comfortable in your sins. But the Spirit convicts us through his word, so that we come to repentance by faith in Jesus Christ. This is what we see in our sermon text today. David sinned grievously. 
grievously. And yet, because David was a true believer, God did not let him go. Like Peter, our brother David also sinned, but the Lord brought him to his spiritual senses by graciously sending him a prophet. How comforting this passage is. As we think about this passage, I want you to be comforted by the gospel. Jehovah says to his people in Jeremiah 31 verse 3, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. God doesn't love us with temporary love, but with an everlasting love. And therefore, how should you respond? As you hear, as you, uh, hear from the preaching of God's word, the response of David, how should you respond in light of God's loving kindness? Repent. You need to repent of your sins and come to the Lord Jesus Christ for refuge. And you can't say, well, pastor, I'm already a Christian. I've done my repentance 20 years ago or 10 years ago when I signed the card or prayed the sinner's prayer. No, no. Repentance is not a one-time act. The entirety of Christian life is a life of repentance. So you confess your sins every day. You repent every day. And you run to Jesus every day for refuge. This is how we persevere. This is how we live the Christian life. You must repent as you hear the preaching of God's word and run to Jesus Christ for refuge. The Lord preserves his people by his word as he brings conviction of sin and repentance unto life. Praise God. As we see what happens to our brother David, let us rejoice in the mercy of our God. The theme of our sermon this morning is this. God calls you to come to him with godly sorrow over your sins and repentance unto life by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our all-sufficient Savior. God calls you, congregation, through his word to come to him. How? With humility, with godly sorrow over your sins and repentance unto life by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's your all-sufficient Savior. Praise be to God. As we consider that theme of how Christ is able to save us and keep us to the uttermost, as we think about the triumph of the mercy of Jesus Christ over our sins, we'll see in our sermon text four gracious ways that the Lord convicts his people. Four gracious ways that the Lord convicts us of our sins and keeps us in the faith to the end. And I want you to be encouraged by this, but I also want you to respond with obedience and faith in Jesus. So four ways that the Lord graciously convicts us of our sins and preserves us in the faith to the end. Number one, God sends ministers. God sends preachers who preach the word. And as the word is preached, God uses that to sanctify his people. Secondly, God grants repentance. Repentance is a gift from God. Thirdly, God proclaims the gospel. And then fourthly, God gives us the hope of resurrection. The hope of resurrection. So that David could have comfort even as he mourns the death of his newborn baby. God gives us the hope of resurrection. So four gracious ways that the Lord keeps us in the faith and convicts us of our sins. So firstly, then our first heading, God sends ministers. Notice how the Lord is gracious and merciful and how he reached out to David. After David committed sin, the Lord didn't leave David in his filth, right? The Lord reached out to his servant. Again, remember this, the Lord will not let his people go. We can try to run away from him, 
But he, by his grace, will triumph over our laziness, our sin, our rebellion, and give us greater affections for him and draw us back to him. He did it with Peter. He does it here with David. And so the Lord graciously sends a prophet, a preacher. Look at verse 1. And the Lord, Jehovah, sent Nathan unto David. I want you to see that this sending of the prophet Nathan to David was an act of God's grace. It was an act of love toward David. Do you understand that? The Lord did not let David persist in his sins, but the Lord intervened in mercy. It's an act of God's mercy when he awakens us from our spiritual slumber, right? It's an act of God's mercy when he does not let us continue in our sins. But he sends conviction, even through a preacher. When God sends a faithful preacher to bring to you his word, Rejoice, rejoice, because that means your faithful shepherd is caring for you. As you hear the word of God proclaimed to you, even this morning, I want you to know that it's the triune Jehovah who's speaking to you through his word. You must respond with humility and obedience. Children, adults, you ought to give the most earnest heed to the things which you hear. You're not, mere, you're not spectators here, but you are those to whom the word of God has come. And so God's word encourages us to pay attention to the preach word and respond with obedience. Listen to a few verses. James 1 verse 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22 says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Did you hear that? Don't just be the hearers of the word, but doers of the word. If you're only hearers, you're deceiving your own selves. James 1 verse 25 says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed by his deed. And so we can multiply even more texts that speak of our duty as listeners to the word of God. We need to listen to God's word and obey what God commands by his grace. Amen. Notice also, and this is really amazing. Notice the boldness and courage of the prophet Nathan. God sent Nathan to David Nathan didn't dilly-dally. He didn't delay. He didn't sugarcoat the message. He obeyed. And he went to the king. He was a man of great courage and love for God and for the king. He came with truth and boldly proclaimed the word of God in love. You see, Nathan could have lost his life for confronting the king, right? And yet he was not afraid, but he proclaimed the word of the Lord, the Lord and called King David to repentance. Dear congregation, as an application for you, you need to pray for your ministers, the ministers of this church. Pray for your ministers to be bold, to be courageous like the prophet Nathan. Pray also for all your office bearers. That they be faithful men, faithful servants of the Lord. That they, by the grace of God, would feed the flock of God with love and compassion, speaking the truth in love. The minister's calling is to preach the word, right? Not his own opinions or not that which pleases the audience, but the word needs to be preached. And the minister's calling is to boldly proclaim the word and never compromise the truth of the gospel. What people think of the minister is irrelevant. Irrelevant. 
The only thing that matters is, is God pleased? Now, of course, God's people rejoice when they hear the word of God. But the minister preaches, for God has called him. The apostle Paul says in Galatians 1 verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Your elders, your ministers, your deacon need your prayers. And so as the preacher, the prophet Nathan comes to King David, he comes with the word of God and he shares a parable. And we see that in verses one through four. Notice, let's look at the parable together. And he came unto him and said unto him that there were two men in, our, in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. And it did, of, did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. Verse 4, and there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd. In other words, the poor man, uh, the, the rich man didn't want to take from his own flock and his own herd. So what did he do in order to feed his guest? He took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. This is a moving story, isn't it? It's a moving story because... This poor man had one lamb that he loved. And he treated that lamb like his children. He treated that lamb like a daughter and cared for that little lamb and nourished it and, and nurtured it. But then there was a rich man in that city who had many flocks and many herds. But when his guest showed up and he needed to feed his guest, he went to the poor man and took took his lamb. You see that word took? That's important because that language is the exact language that is used about David in the previous chapter. 2 Samuel 11 verse 4, and David sent messenger and took her. Just like the rich man took the poor man's lamb. That's what David did. He took the wife of someone else. And made her his own. So in this illustration that Nathan is using, the poor man is Uriah the Hittite. Remember also Uriah the Hittite means that he was not a native born Jew, right? He was a pagan, a stranger who humbled himself embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ and became a child of God by faith in Jesus. He was adopted into God's family. He became a Jew by faith in Jesus. He was a godly man. And Uriah the Hittite loved his wife. This is what every godly husband is called to do, right? Love your wife. Love your wife, husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. But the rich man in the story represents King David, who coveted his neighbor's wife and took her for himself. And of course, got rid of the poor man and killed him. Well, as David heard the story, he was angry. His sense of justice made him so angry and outraged that he wanted to administer justice. Notice what David says in verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, as Jehovah liveth, that man, the man that has done this thing, shall surely what? Die. David was speaking about himself. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold. Because he did this thing and watch. Because he had no pity. Even David understood that this man who would treat a poor man like that has no pity. Well, David had no pity. He took someone else's wife. And he had the husband murdered in order to cover up his sin. 
David had no pity, no compassion. And by David's response, he passes a sentence upon himself, right? He's the rich man who showed no pity, but took what did not belong to him. And I want you to see here in verse 7 that Nathan doesn't stop there and says, all right, David, I'll see you tomorrow. He applies it to David. See, it's one thing to share information. It's another thing to apply the word of God and call people to repentance. Here, Nathan applies this parable to David and confronts him. Children, this could have cost him his life. He was talking to the king. And, and, and yet notice what Nathan says to David, verse 7. Thou art the man. I was talking about you, David. Thou art the man. You see, as long as David was comparing himself with other people, this supposed rich man who David think was someone else, as long as you compare yourself with other people, you can see yourselves as saints. In fact, man thinks that he is a god. But when you look at yourself in the mirror of God's law, you see your sin in its true light. The standard is not other people. The standard is the perfect law of liberty. We have broken the law of God. And so I can say to you, thou art the man. You have offended God. You have violated his, his law. You are under his wrath. And the only refuge is Jesus Christ. Notice verse 9. Nathan reminds David that he despised the commandment of God. That he did evil in God's sight by killing Uriah the Hittite and taking Uriah's wife to, his, to be his own wife. In verses 7 and 9, Nathan also reminds David of the kindness of the Lord toward him, right? Now, notice verse 8. It should not be a problem for us, but I want you to see this. Verse 8 says, And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Okay. Now, the point of verse 8 is not that God approves of polygamy. Okay. Polygamy is contrary to the law of God. Having more than one wife is contrary to the law of God. That's not the point. Again, marriage, let me remind you, is a covenant union between one man and one woman for wife, the, for life. The point here is this. The Lord was merciful toward David, right? The Lord showed him kindness and treated him with great generosity and bounty. In response to the Lord's kindness, how should David have behaved? He should have been what? Content. He should have been thankful. Instead of taking something that doesn't belong to him. That's the point. The Lord was merciful toward David. David should have been thankful for what he had. But he became discontented, right? And he desired something more, something else. All that the Lord had given him meant nothing to him. And he was ready to despise the Lord's command for a woman who was not his. To satisfy his lusts. What about you? Are you content in Christ? Are you satisfied with him? Do you know that Christ is your all-sufficient savior and that his grace is sufficient for you? Are you cultivating a life of gratitude and thanksgiving? Or are you longing for something else, something better, because you're not happy with the way the Lord has dealt with you? How foolish is that? You know, Christian, how the Lord has dealt with you? He has saved you from hell. And he gives you food and a roof above your head. How can we not be content? How can we complain or murmur or grumble and desire something that doesn't belong to us? You need to cultivate gratitude as a Christian. 
The life of a Christian is a life of thanksgiving. And we obey Christ out of a heart filled with gratitude for the wonders he has done. We sang that, didn't we? What do you have that you did not receive? And if everything you have, you receive by the mercy of God, why do you act as though you didn't receive it by grace? Now, one more thing I want you to see here, which convicted me very much. And it has been something that the Lord has been convicting me for for over a year. I want you to see here how Nathan applied the word to David. And the Lord used it to bring David to repentance and restoration, right? Nathan didn't just share information. He applied the word of God to him. Thou art the man. What can we learn from that about preaching? Preaching is not a lecture. Preaching is not mere sharing of information. There is an urgency in preaching. Lives are at stake. The minister must make applications and apply the word of God to the people. I've been held by a man called Joel Beakey. He's a minister up in Michigan. He writes about how preaching needs to be applicatory, meaning preaching needs to have application as the word of God penetrates into the hearts of the people so that people don't walk away with some information in their head. But they are told, this is the word of God and you are supposed to live differently by the grace of God because God calls you to come to him by faith. Joel Beakey writes, quote, applicatory preaching is the process of riveting truth so powerfully in people that they cannot help but see how they must change and how they can be empowered to do so. It applies the text to every aspect of a listener's life, promoting by the grace of the Spirit a religion that is power and not mere form, end quote. And so as we look at 2 Samuel 12, let's not point fingers at David. The law of God is pointing fingers at you. How would you respond? The law of God exposes your spiritual bankruptcy apart from Christ. The only proper response is repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. You need to fly to Jesus and cast yourselves at the mercy of a gracious Savior who is willing and ready to forgive your sins. If you come to him, By faith. And this brings us to our second heading, the second glorious way that the Lord convicts us of our sins and keeps us in the faith is by bringing us to repentance. Reality, that glorious reality, the Lord doesn't leave us in our sin comfortable, but he keeps prodding and he keeps exposing our sins and keeps convicting us until we give up and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. This is what the Lord does here as he grants repentance to his servant, David. Look at verse 13. Notice how David responds. And David said unto Nathan, verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. David acknowledges that what the Lord is saying is true, right? He's no longer making excuses. He's no longer trying to hide his sin. But he confesses, I have sinned against the Lord. And yes, David sinned against Bathsheba. And yes, David sinned against Uriah the Hittite. And yes, David sinned against those, the families of those men who died in the battlefield as he was trying to get Uriah murdered. But his sin was primarily and ultimately against who? God. And so he says in Psalm 51, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Because sin is transgression of the law of God. Sin is cosmic treason. 
David, as a true believer, because he was a true believer, confessed his sins and responded with humility and turned to the Lord. I hope you see this. True repentance doesn't make excuses for sin. True repentance doesn't shift the blame. Oh, it's the woman that thou gavest me. No, that's not true repentance. True repentance takes the responsibility and says, Lord, I have sinned against thee. And if you were to give me justice, Lord, I would be in hell right now. This is what I deserve. I deserve to what? Die. I deserve to die. True repentance acknowledges that the Lord is true, his law is perfect, and therefore we've short, fallen short of the glory of God. The Shorter Catechism teaches us that repentance unto life is, life is a saving grace, meaning it's a gift of God, whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with grief and hatred of his sin, turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. You see, David needed to be broken by the law of God in order that he might be comforted by the gospel of Christ, right? That's what we need. We need to be broken by the law of God so that we run to Jesus for life, for hope, for all that we have. We need the good news of the gospel. And as David was broken by the law of God, he was ready to hear the good news that Nathan the prophet is about to proclaim. You see, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law of God strips us of any boasting in ourselves and exposes us as beggars and spiritually bankrupt criminals that we are so that we see the righteous robe of Jesus Christ as more precious than life. We desire to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. Nothing else will do. The blood of bulls and goats, children, can never take away our sins. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sins. And that's what we need. In light of that, God is calling you as well to repent. Do not play with your sins. Do not postpone your repentance. But with grief and hatred of your sin today, turn from it unto God by faith in Jesus Christ. Jehovah says in Ezekiel 18, verse 30, Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Sin will bring you to ruin. But turn to Jesus Christ for life. You must come to Christ, embrace him, and submit to his lordship. If there are any unbelievers present here today living in rebellion against Christ, the word of God says to you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Christians, redeemed people of God, the word of God says to you, repent. Sin is your enemy. Amen. Sin is your enemy, and an unconfessed sin is an enemy that you have welcomed into your house, and you're serving him dinner. Confess your sins before God. Don't welcome sin as a guest, because sin is your enemy. 1 John 1, 9 promises that if we confess our sins, this is glorious. He is what? faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't have to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. You don't have to climb the stairs of St. Peter's Basilica. You don't have to produce enough merits to receive forgiveness. Believe in Christ. Believe in Christ and God will forgive you. Our brother David here had godly sorrow like the apostle Peter and he received forgiveness. 
But there is also the sorrow of the world. You know that, right? Think about Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot also denied Christ. But he was not a true believer. Judas Iscariot was not a Christian. And so when he got caught, he had sorrow. But it was not godly sorrow, but the sorrow of the world. What about you? The word of God says, the sorrow of the world worketh death. You must have godly sorrow. The worldly sorrow is basically the sorrow that you got caught. You feel bad because you're exposed before men. And and your good name has been tarnished because of your stupidity. That's not godly sorrow. Godly sorrow sees that my offense is against God. I've offended him. I need to be reconciled to God. We've offended the holy God of heaven and earth, and we deserve death, not just physical death, but eternal death of body and soul in hell. But because of the person and work of Jesus Christ, adults, children, those who truly repent receive mercy and forgiveness of sins. This is the good news of the gospel. And this brings us to our third heading. God proclaims the gospel. Notice here how God through the mouth of his servant, Nathan, brings the good news of the gospel to his servant, David. Look at this glorious verse, verse 13 again. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. This is the gospel, amen? The Lord has hath put away thy sin. Now you got to ask yourself this question. Children, you need to ask yourself this question. How could Nathan say that? And how could God do that? God is not corrupt. He's a just and holy God. And David did deserve to die. How could God say to David, your sins are put away. You will not die. How could God do that without compromising his justice? How can God forgive your sins and not be a corrupt judge? You know, the, I hope you know the answer to that question. You see how this chapter cries for the work of redemption in Christ? God can forgive you and not compromise his justice because God put our sins upon the cross and crushed his son in our place, that he might be just and the justifier of those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. God did not compromise his justice. God put David's sins and the sins of all of God's elect upon the shoulders of his only begotten son, who died on the cross for our sins and satisfied divine justice. That's why God could forgive David. And that's why God can forgive you this morning. Amen. Romans 5 says, Christ died for the ungodly. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for David, and therefore he could be forgiven. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But there's also a warning here, isn't there? Here's the warning. Watch this. Although David was forgiven, although his fellowship with God was restored, his sin had consequences. David was forgiven. True believers can never lose their salvation. But your sins will have consequences and David had to suffer the consequences of his sin the rest of his days on the earth notice how the Lord promises consequences he did so in verse 11 
Private sins bring public consequences. And notice in verse 14 as well. How be it? So David, you're forgiven. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Watch. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. There's a warning for us here. Our secret sins are never secret before the Lord. Our secret sins will be exposed. That's why we need to repent and run to Jesus for refuge. And by his grace, kill sin. The sins of believers bring reproach upon the name of Christ. But I, look at verse 14 with me. Notice what ver, verse 14 is saying. This is glorious. The child of David was going to die, right? Because of David's sins. The child of David died in the place of David. That's the gospel. Jesus, our substitute, died in our place. And there is a greater child of David, the Lord of David, Jesus Christ, who would die in his place in order for David to be forgiven. David was forgiven, but someone else died in his place. And someone else died in your place in order for you to be forgiven. See, God doesn't brush sins aside. He doesn't hide sins under the carpet, pretending like they don't exist. He put our sins publicly upon Jesus, who was humiliated for us. The sins, the punishment that we deserved was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Jesus took our punishment upon himself. Well, as David is forgiven, he's restored to fellowship with God. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he still will have to face consequences. And he sees even in this chapter, as he walks through the valley of the shadow of death, as he mourns the death of his newborn child, in verses 15 through 23, the Lord of all comfort is with David. Amen? The Lord of all comfort, the God of consolation, is with David. And God is with you as well in the gospel. Your sins will bring consequences. But if you repent, God will forgive your sins and he will not leave you. He will not erase your name from the Lamb's book of life. Those whom God has saved, he will keep to the end. So that when you go through trials, sometimes we go through trials of our own making. Isn't that true? Many times we have disastrous consequences of our own bad choices. And yet, as we go through those trials, we're not alone. Emmanuel is with us. The Lord is with us in his mercy and grace. And so David could go through this trial of the death of his baby because his hope was in the risen Savior Jesus Christ. And so as Christians, we don't mourn the way the world mourns. You know why? Because death has lost its sting. Love those words. Death has lost its sting because Jesus Christ is risen. And when you put your hope in Jesus Christ, that hope will never make you ashamed. And this brings us to our final heading. God gives the hope of resurrection. God gives the hope of resurrection. So in verse 15, we read that the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and the child was very sick. And so David sought the Lord in prayer to preserve the life of his baby. David even fasted and prayed. But verse 18 tells us that on the seventh day, the child died. And as David hears the news of the death of his child in verse 20, what, how does David respond? He washes himself and he goes into the house of the Lord. And what does he do? He worships. He worships. This is the response of the Christian. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
David worships the Lord. And his servants are wondering, why is David acting this way? While the child was sick, David was mourning and he was fasting. And now that the child is dead, David wants to eat food. What's going on here? Watch what David says. Verse 23. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And I want you to know here that David's peaceful response expresses hope beyond the grave. David can respond this way because of the hope of the resurrection. David's peaceful response here is in contrast to his painful grief over the death of another son, Absalom, who's going to die in 2 Samuel 18. And David could not be comforted because he knew that Absalom died in unbelief and rebellion. But here, David has a hope. He has this note of hope to see his child one day. I will go to him, says David. I believe that this suggests that David believed that one day in glory, he would see his covenant child who died in infancy. The canons of Dort certainly makes this application. Listen, quote, Godly parents have no reason to doubt of the election and salvation of their children, whom it pleaseth God to call out of this life in their infancy, end quote. I know that many of us, even in this uh, congregation, have walked through these difficult trials of losing our little ones, either in the womb or even... Young children. And yet, God's word comforts us. Those whom God is pleased to take with, uh, take to heaven, we will see them one day in glory. And there is a greater encouragement here from this portion that applies even to our bodies today that are weak and achy and aging Jesus Christ is risen. And one day, he will raise all of his people to glory imperishable. One day, he will give us all resurrection bodies so that we can say with Job, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin, and though after my skin, worms destroy In this body, in this flesh, I shall see God. That's Job 19, verses 25 and 26. So Job is saying, my Redeemer lives. Jesus is not a dead Savior, but the risen Lord. One day, I will see my Redeemer in my body. After worms eat my flesh in the grave, I will see him in my body. How could that be? It's because one day Jesus will raise his people to life. That day is coming when the dead shall hear his voice. And those who have died in Christ will be raised to glory. And we will receive incorruptible, imperishable, glorified resurrection bodies. And we will be with the Lord forever. Be comforted by the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as you mourn and grieve and go through the trials of this life. Listen to what Jesus said in John 11. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you hear that? Not only does Jesus give resurrection, he is the resurrection and he is the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. This hope of the resurrection produces perseverance. Amen. You can be patient in your trials. You can be patient in adversity. You can be patient and endure affliction. Because one day your sufferings will be over. Paul says in Romans 8, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Therefore, You walk by faith today and tomorrow till the Lord calls you home. 
walk by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day you will see your savior. And one day he will give you resurrection bodies. Look at verse 24. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son and he called his name, what? Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Again, verse 24 points us to the gospel. I hope you see that. Verse 24. Because out of David's lineage and out of Solomon's lineage would come the Savior of the world. Children, boys and girls, do you realize that Bathsheba, this woman, the mother of Solomon is included in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew 1. Listen to Matthew 1 verse 6. And Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. This is good news. God uses even the sins of people to bring about his good purposes. He is sovereign even over our sins. The purposes of the Lord shall stand. In the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem us from the curse of the law. Jesus Christ, the greater Solomon has come. What does the name Solomon mean? Uh, or uh, notice what it says about Solomon. The Lord loved him, right? He was given the name Jedediah, which means loved by the Lord. Loved by Jehovah. It says the Lord loved Solomon. But we will see. Solomon was not a perfect king. Solomon sinned against the Lord. Solomon displeased the Lord. But do you know that there is a greater Solomon? About whom God the Father said at the baptism. This is my son. In whom I'm well pleased. The Lord Jesus Christ never sinned. He never sinned but he died for our sins that we might be reconciled to God well the chapter ends then with the triumph of David the Lord's anointed David uh, destroys and defeats the Ammonites in verses 26 through 31 remember in two chapters ago the Ammonites refused to submit to the Lord's anointed and now David destroys them you know why? Because it is utter folly and insanity to not submit to the anointed king. Someone greater than David, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the warning we see in Psalm 2. Kiss the son or what? Perish. Kiss the son or perish. But those of you who are Christians, rejoice in the Lord's mercy in your lives. Our Lord Jesus declares in John 10, My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Your good shepherd cares for you. Your good shepherd holds you fast. So make diligent use of the means of grace and grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Christ the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Let us pray. Let us stand for prayer. Our Father and our God, we give thee thanks for thy word. Help us to respond with humility as David did. Help us, O Lord, to confess our sins before thee and run to Jesus Christ for refuge. We give thee thanks, O Lord, that the good work that thou hast begun in us, thou art faithful to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Thou will never leave us nor forsake us. We are covered in thy hands and underneath are the everlasting arms so that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Father, we give thee thanks for thy mercy upon our congregation. Help us as a church to keep growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, O Lord, to die more and more to sin and to live more and more unto righteousness. Help us, protect us from pride and help us to glory and boast in the finished work of of the cross. We give thee thanks, O Lord, for uh, the birth of uh, precious children in our midst. Uh, in particular, a few days ago, a uh, little Eli Delgado was born. We give thee thanks, O Lord, for his birth. We pray that thou would continue to be with him and with other precious children who were recently born. Be with them and the mothers. We pray, O Lord, also for those uh, sisters who are still with child. Continue to bless their pregnancies and these unborn children. May they continue to grow and develop and be healthy and strong. We pray in due time for safe delivery and safe birth of these precious children that we might even welcome them in our midst and rejoice in the goodness, in thy goodness.